it was a 100 person exonerated. He said he walked out of Florence on a phone call from his attorney told him to roll him up. And he was surprised that DNA evidence had, had shown him to be innocent, and as he knew he had been. Because he was 100, when he walked out of prison, a lot of microphones were shoved in front of his face, a lot of TV cameras were on him. Um, during, during that time in prison, uh, Ray Crone, who probably had been about as religious as most of us, got more religious when he was on death row. And uh, some, some reporter asked him, so what do you suppose? Why did your God have me on uh, death row for 10 years? And they said, well, it may not have been about the uh, last 10 years. It may be what I'm supposed to do with the next 10 years. And he has gone on to be a very vocal um, uh, spokesperson for the abolishment of capital punishment. Um, this is a report from, it's an older report. It's put out by the Death Penalty Information Center. Deathpenalty.org is a great resource. And this report is 20-some years old. But it's the death penalty in black and white. And it simply states that uh, people of color are, are far more likely to be placed on death row than, than are Caucasians. Uh, people of color who execute Caucasians, you know, it's just almost a, a direct ticket. Uh, Troy Davis, uh, most likely an innocent man, was executed in Georgia just a couple of months ago uh, for allegedly killing a white woman. Although uh, many of the witnesses recanted their testimony. Uh, another another uh, report, and all these reports are available online at deathpenaltyinformation.org, uh, is the crisis of confidence. Many people object to the death penalty simply because we can't get it right. Illinois abolished the death penalty because they had over 12, no, they, we had 12. They had 30 people who were exonerated that were proved to be innocent. They were on death row, but Further studies show them to be innocent. Uh, Smart on Crime is an interesting publication because it really addresses the dollars and cents of, of capital punishment. Capital punishment is exceptionally costly. And in Arizona, where we don't have a big part, where we're not going to be driven by compassion, we might be driven by dollars and cents. We, you know, we had we had to sell our our uh, state capitol buildings in the Senate and the legislators, and now we rent them back. Well, in this financial crisis that we're in, it might be smart to stop killing people because it costs 20 times more to execute somebody than it does to support them on uh, in life in prison. The most recent publication is uh, Struck by Lightning, and it speaks to the arbitrary and capricious nature of capital punishment. In, in, and it varies from county to county and state to state. Here in Arizona, the majority of capital cases are prosecuted in Maricopa <coughs> County and in Pima County, because these are the two largest counties, and we are the counties that have the money to take the cases. De death is different, and death costs more. I mean, from the very beginning, when the county prosecutor decides to go for capital punishment, when he wants to execute, he's got to assign two attorneys, two defense attorneys. All the way up, it's doubled and it's more expensive. Then, then there are tremendous numbers of appeals. You can't, you can't, uh, you can't bring somebody back once you've executed. And you have executed a, a number of innocent men. Uh, Troy Davis, as I said, was most likely innocent. Uh, Cameron Todd Willingham in Texas was definitely innocent. He was, a, he was accused of setting fire to a trailer in, in which his children died in the fire. He didn't set the fire. Uh, it was a tragic accident. Faulty forensic evidence, real bad science at the time of the initial trial showed him to be guilty. Subsequent evidence showed him to be innocent. But um, Governor, um, what's his name, Rick Perry? Yeah. yeah, yeah he, a name we all know. And anyhow, um, Perry, even though he heard the evidence, chose not to uh, not to uh, interfere and allow this man to be executed. I uh, I probably could go on and on with this. I, I will try to uh, put up a couple of things for you. Our website is simply acdeathpenalty.org. And 
there you can go to get some, some information. The, uh, the state organization is azabolitionist.org. And the other one that is a great resource is simply death penalty information. I guess death penalty info. Now, if any of you are free, I encourage you to go to clemency hearings. They're very, very uh, eye-opening and give you an insight into our justice system, or as I perceive it, our injustice system. Um, I've attended the last six clemency hearings. I got involved in 2007 when we executed Robert Comer. That was the first execution in Arizona in seven years. Comer was what we term a volunteer, which means he gave up all of his appeals and just said, take me. So he was executed in 2007. We did not have another execution till October of 2010. Jeff Landry was executed. Uh, if you if you had come to the clemency hearing and heard about this man's life and all the mitigating circumstances and, and the many things that aren't brought up in trial, uh, you, it 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 really gets to your heart to think that we're killing these people. And again, I'm not defending what they do. But I am, it's not about them, it's not about what they do, it's about us. What kind of a society do you want to be? Capital punishment is the most premeditated of any murder. And, uh, and I just uh, encourage all of you to join us. Uh, we have, uh, join us, uh, you know, sign up. We, we won't give you too many emails, but we will keep you posted what's going on. The, the clemency hearing next Friday for Robert Towery is at 8.30 down in Florence. So you gotta leave here an hour early or an hour and 15 minutes early and go down to the lining unit at the Iman prison. Can I see a show of hands of people who have been to Florence? Well, a, a goodly number of you. It's an amazing town. I mean, just absolutely nothing but a prison town. Uh, with Canal County Jail and two state prisons and a number of uh, uh, for profit prisons, you know, other than a couple of fast food places, there's no place else to work but the uh, prison down there. But at any rate, the clemency hearings are really eye opening. Uh, what our group does is on the eve of every execution, we will hold a vigil at the state capitol. So out on the Senate lawn at 6 o'clock this Tuesday, the 28th, on the eve of Robert Mormon's execution. A number of us will gather, and I invite you to join us. Uh, it won't be long, possibly a half hour. Uh, maybe we'll have some people from the uh, legislature speak, or somebody some from another organization speak. Cox Christie, which is a Catholic peace organization, will have uh, a prayer service. Uh, and, and other organizations who wish to join us, Buddhists have been there. Quakers have been there. At any rate, I, uh, I'm, I'm so delighted to be here with all of you today because uh, I felt like I was coming home with uh, Elizabeth and the, and the work down at, uh, with the homeless. Uh, there's a lot of good work to be done down there with St. Joseph the Worker or Andre House or Justice Center. And uh, I've been to Arabaca. I've had the opportunity to camp out there and, and walk the trails. And, I was there when you started the, uh, the Inter Interfaith Workers Justice. I, the only thing I haven't done is go on to Sable Peaks. So, so <coughs> I'll give the mic to you and you can tell us Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for helping to kind of weave the threads and connect with us. I think at the end we'll find that we all do participate in a lot of these struggles and issues. And then finally, one that's actually near and dear to my own heart because I'll see the piece out on the front window every morning. Um, our folks to talk a little bit about the ongoing human rights and environmental justice issues around the state of peace. Hello, my name is 
Jewish to need of Nali. My mother's heritage is Russian Polish, but my father's is Dumas. The eighth is Yiddishka. I am considered to be a red coat. In my in my clan, my first clan, and Twadichini Bashishchini, I'm born for the Twadichini, the bitter water people. Um, not by Dinea Dashinella. The wandering people are my paternal grandparents and Polish Olyeni Dashiche. The ones that are called Polish are my maternal grandparents. And that's how I introduce myself. Um, I am Dinea. Uh, we call ourselves Dinea, but most people know us as Navajo. And uh, our home is in the Four Corners region, in the area there. Um, and the most western boundary for our people is a beautiful ecological island called the Holy San Francisco Peaks. How many of you have, uh, how many of you know of the San Francisco Peaks, first of all? How many of you know of its incredible beauty? that it is a ecological island that is home to uh, sacred plants, animals, minerals, um, as well as uh, endangered species. This is all there, yeah. And did you also know that it is home to deities uh, for different tribal nations, yeah? The Hopi. The Hopi the Apache, the Havasupai, many different um, tribal nations that my brother Clayson will touch upon. Um, this is my daughter, Daish Chill, and her name uh, means it began to snow. That's when she was born. And it, it's kind of ironic because she was born when it began to snow, and uh, I'm a plaintiff to protect real snow on the holy San Francisco peaks. I'm part of the Save the Peaks Coalition, as well as being a, uh, a private citizen who has uh, filed a lawsuit against the United States Forest Service. Um, real quickly, the Save the Peaks Coalition is a forum of folks who are interested, who care about protecting the Holy San Francisco Peaks, uh, whether it's for environmental purposes, whether it's for spiritual, uh, cultural purposes, um, it's a forum to bring together folks to have a unified voice. Um, and the Save the Peaks Coalition was formed in 19, or 2004, sorry. Um, and that was because the United States Forest Service had this grand plan, along with a ski resort, to use reclaimed sewage effluent on the Holy San Francisco Peaks. And the Forest Service kept telling citizens who were concerned, kept telling medicine, tribal medicine practitioners who were concerned, kept telling environmentalists that were concerned, kept telling anybody who was concerned that, well, we deal with uh, tribes on a government-to-government -government basis, and since you're not part of the government, you don't have a voice. So, hence, the Save the Peaks Coalition was formed uh, to be a forum. Hello, yeah, and my name is Clayce Timberdali. My sister and my niece, and my father and mother are here as well. And we currently reside in Flagstaff, and as many of you know, the San Francisco Peaks, surrounding California. And it's here, and it's such a significant part of 13 tribes. It's basically the Adam and Eve story. It's for the Diné people, the four sacred mountains, and there are two that are inside of those four sacred boundaries that are masculine and feminine. And this mountain represents adulthood. It is kind of like the structure here where we have each of these boundaries. And if you were to take out one of these, these sections, these corners, you know, for our people, you know, this is cultural genocide. It destroys our culture. For the Hopi people, this is where the Kachinas, the Katsinas live, and they pray to these mountains for the moisture, for the precipitation, and if man is making snow out of reclaimed wastewater, then what does that mean for this culture? And you know, where does this leave room for the Kachinas to, to actually make the snow? So for the Gan, for the, the Apache, the San Carlos, the Amapai, many different bands, this is actually a place of a of when somebody passes, 
and they move into the spirit world. This is where they pass directly through this mountaintop. So it's very significant, not only being a watershed for the entire north, um, I guess, portion of the, the, color, the Colorado Plateau, like Yan Rim, but this particular region is so significant that you know, for indigenous people, what is currently taking place there is, you know, I, I guess it's so heartbreaking and it, it's it's really hard for most, most people to understand that yes, they have been putting pipes in and doing destruction. And I guess my sister will kind of give you a little bit of an update. We have such a short amount of time. But as to the, how we got to where we are currently legally, because it, it's very interesting. I was going to ask you to talk about the legal case, actually. So, go ahead. so um, there have been other legal cases before ours. Uh, we, I think the first legal case that was um, brought to the courts was from the Hopi tribe, the Navajo Medicine Men's Association, and Richard Wilson. And that was a case called Wilson versus Block. Now, I'm not an attorney, but I, I do know a lot about law, being that, you know, being a plaintiff, you've got to learn, uh, you've got to learn a little bit. Um, and there was another case filed by the Navajo Nation along um, with other tribes and environmental groups, and that was based on REFRA. Now, the first case, uh, Wilson versus Block, that was de determined by the courts. They said, well, uh, there's no problems with religious freedom. Here, uh, you Native Americans can go pray on the other side of the mountain. Not understanding that we as indigenous people view, we understand the Holy San Francisco Peaks to be one living entity. You can't just put her up into small percentage pieces and say, okay, this hand belongs to the recreationist. This hand belongs to the herbalist. You can't do things like that because she is one uh, entity. And so uh, that case was lost. The second case. They said you can go for any other. Yeah, they basically said you can go for any other side of the mountain. And so the second case was uh, by the Navajo Nation, the Dine Medicine Men's Association. Um, and the environmental organizations, and that was called the Navajo Nation et al. versus United States Forest Service. And that case uh, was based on RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and also NEPA, but the NEPA case was thrown out, and I'll get to that one a little bit later. But the Religious uh, Freedom Restoration Act, that case was lost. And it showed indigenous people uh, it, it told indigenous people that we have no uh, right, we have no guaranteed protection for our religious freedom when it comes to public lands. Now you think about that and you kind of wonder, public lands, wait a minute, isn't this all indigenous land? Isn't this all stolen land from the original occupants? So how can you tell us that our holy places, that our sacred sites are, are considered to be more important uh, to the business and the economic interests of, uh, of some small communities and not to entire tribal nations. And so uh, with our case, and my brother is also a plaintiff, um, we because that NEPA case was thrown out, um, we uh, we saw that you know if there if that's being thrown out on a technicality. Oh, okay, sorry. So basically, um, the previous lawsuit, the NEPA, which is National Environmental Policy Act, which um, was all the environmental concerns because. There's a lot of science that had just started coming out. The usage of reclaimed wastewater, you know, is something that I think at the time they, they're basically saying that this is great uh, A plus wastewater, and that it's basically potable, even though it's not potable. ADAQ, Arizona Department of Air and Water Quality, um, basically just kind of 
allowed this company to lobby them and said, yeah, we would like this to be used for snowmaking. So they immediately changed it in their regulations and said, okay, this is acceptable for the use of snowmaking. And there was no procedural process in checking the science. And at the time, there are scientists and individuals that were studying and finding that this water does uh, contain endocrine disruptors, personal care products, pharmaceuticals, caffeine, whatever you, you flush down your toilet, basically, you know, that's what will end up on this mountain. And the, the concept of, it, I guess, when we challenged um, the snowball, the Forest Service, uh, we were just asking, how come, you know, you're not taking into account what would happen if a child ingests the snow made from re reclaimed wastewater? And that was what our case was based on. And when we took it to the, the court here, the district court in Phoenix, Murguia ruled against us, basically stating that um, the project was complete. It was near completion, which it had not even begun until this past um, summer when they actually started putting in pipes. And there's a lot of history, a lot of things that have been moving forward. And we just appealed, took it to San Francisco, San Francisco, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and there we had um, three judges that are all Republican from Nixon, uh, Bush. Bush, and Reagan. So these particular individuals have never ruled favorably for any environmental issues, and we were up against this in the courts. And immediately in the, the test, the oral arguments by the judges, you know, they immediately stated, we're not scientists, we don't care what's in the water, we just want to know if the procedural process was followed. So from there we basically had an indication that, you know, things weren't going to go in our favor. Being that they say that the procedural process was followed, um, and talking about endocrine disruptors, uh, there isn't any adequate analysis. There aren't the studies that are driving the ADEQ with uh, with allowing for snowmaking to be used by uh, for a plus reclaimed wastewater, and so uh, that's that's a huge point because uh, we need to know what's we need to know what's in our water. We need to know what we're ingesting. And um, you know, I I sued the United States Forest Service as a mom. You know, I don't want my children to be playing in reclaimed sewage effluent where there are known endocrine disruptors that could adversely affect their systems. And there's, there's just, there's something, there, it's, it's wrong that the United States Forest Service would allow for our children to be test subjects and guinea pigs for inadequate study. <laughs> So there are, you know, what 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 can you do? I don't know. Are any of you snowboarders or skiers? I'm a snowboarder. I know that when I'm going down, I'm going downhill, and if I face plant, I know that I'm going to eat snow. And that's just how it is. And when it's warm and it gets slushy, I know that I will ingest snow. I know that children will ingest snow. I don't go skiing or, well, I don't go snowboarding with a bottle of water in my pocket because I don't want to fall on it. But, you know, I, I eat snow. I eat snow. My children eat snow. We all eat snow. Animals eat snow. And so when when we don't have a choice, and the, the Forest Service and the ski resort have said that what they will do is they will post signs that say, do not eat the snow. <laughs> I guess with that bit of humor, I don't know if we... Yeah, why don't we move into some questions okay. now? Okay. So oh, can I just, real quick, our web, there's some websites. We'll, we can write them down um, and what, what people can do. So I wanted to just real quick quickly say, you know, let people in your community know because the Arizona Snow Bowl and the Forest Service have repeatedly stated that they rely upon the skiers and the snowboarders from this area, from the metropolitan Phoenix area, from uh, 
you know, from this city, you drive Flagstaff's economy. They're looking to you. And so when you, when you step up and you say, or you write letters to our city council and you tell them, don't sell the reclaimed wastewater with known endocrine dust revenues, don't sell that to the Arizona Snowball. Don't test, don't allow for them to test on our children. When you tell um, the Arizona Snowball, when you write them letters, tell them, hey, I'm from this area, I'm from your, your um, economic pool that you're trying to um, get more money from. Let them know that you will not support a business that utilizes reclaimed wastewater. Thank you. Thank you all so much. So, I mean, as you can see, we have a lot going on here in the state. Um, we, you know, folks outside Arizona may not understand the full depth and the range of issues, but from the southern <coughs> desert lowlands to the highest northern elevations, um, human rights struggles are fully engaged and joined here in Arizona. So we have some time for questions. Um, so if you have something specific for one of our panelists or something general that you'd like multiple folks to engage, that's great. Why don't you go ahead and just shout it out and then I'll repeat the question back so we can all hear it. Um, hi, I'm also acquainted with the Save the Peak Coalition and Janine Place will be performing at 530 at San Joaquin. Their lawyer, Howard Shanker, has been doing this case for us for total three. He's going to be here tonight. Please go up to him and give him a big hug. <laughs> and um, thank all the panelists for um, informing us of, of uh, the realities of the dangers of the state. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a long case, right? I mean, the trial was in Prescott some years ago. I was actually at the hearing that just happened in San Francisco. I was there for the sunrise ceremony and the, oh, was outside you. the courthouse. And it's just been a long <laughs> struggle, but it points out the limitations of the legal system as an effective dispute resolution mechanism as well, right? Sometimes those claims are not cognizable in a legal sense. And that's you know, part of the human rights issues that I think might be common across the board here are the ways that you navigate the legal system um, you know, as part of the larger struggle. Does anybody want to speak to that at all? Just that piece of it? I know, you know, we've heard some from the Save the Peace folks. Does anybody else want to speak to the, the legal aspects just a little bit? We have two then, we'll use two. Um, well, I just wanted to uh, speak on different mechanisms that, or arguments that people have used to um, get rid of uh, camping lots. And one of the major ones is that um, if there's not enough capacity uh, in the shelter system to hold the people, um, then it, um, it, it is cruel and unusual punishment to um, charge people with camping or to get into jail for camping or violence or parole for camping. Um, but the thing is, um, there have been some cases that have been won. In Los Angeles, they won. Uh, but sometimes, even if these laws are totally overly broad and overreaching, um, it can be very frustrating uh, to, um, to challenge them because um, the, we don't have access. We don't have certain rights, and those people have in other countries. We don't have economic rights. We don't have right. We have no right to housing. We have no right to food. We have no right, you know, to anything basically. And um, it's partly because of the way you know our government was structured as being the first um, democracy and having one of the oldest constitutions. Um, and so I think that you know it's important. Like I said, we're working with the ACLU to you know try to. Get a lot of evidence of you know harassment, but also evidence of lack of capacity, and that there's a clear evidence of lack of capacity in the system, especially for you know, certain individuals who are um, professionally excluded from um, CAPS uh, or other shelter services. And um, so, you know, it will take years. Basically, Dan Machado told me told us it would probably take three years or something to collect enough evidence even if they decide to go to, to trial. And so we've been dutifully sending in about, probably sending in about over 100 um, uh, incident reports. But, you know, in the end, um, maybe there are things that should be in the Constitution that aren't, and we 
cannot necessarily, the arguments that we think of why something is good or bad or wrong or should be true are not necessarily the arguments in, in the legal system. And, um, you know, so you can fall back on certain uh, technicalities of, of trying to sort of twist the, not twist the Constitution, but, you know, bend it to your, to your will. Um, but if you run up against bad judges, you know, um, that's, that's an issue. But also just in general, most of the people that are getting, you know, harassed because of these laws um, or uh, cited because of these laws are uh, perpetually excluded and have um, often multiple conditions. Not everybody, of course, because we look at the average after being over six months or whatever. Um, a lot of different things. Um, I think that, you know, these people still have to deal with all of the tickets, all of the, um, the negative ramifications of having this perpetual uh, criminalization, and um, it, it sort of creates an uh, outside cast, and these people don't have representation, so their cases are very often not, not successful. And so, um, it can be very, very frustrating because you work with uh, or you see people that have that are in situations that they will never ever get out of because of um, convictions they have, and you know they they they, try, they want to change their lives, but um, the criminal justice system holds them back a lot. So in some cases, the legal system becomes an inhibitor of human rights rather than to secure those rights. So let's just hear real quick from a couple of the other panelists about legal issues. We'll move down the, the line and then we'll take some other questions. Uh, so we had the case I mentioned earlier where two people were prosecuted for uh, transporting people and burying a medical attention to the hospital. That's usually the side we're on. We're usually being charged with stuff, not bringing our own lawsuits. Another example of that was when two people were, or multiple people were ticketed for littering for leaving uh, down the water in the desert. Um, and it's, it's ironic on a lot of levels and almost like absurdist because we, we bring back the list to take litter out of the desert. We, we take out far more than we leave behind, which is, you know, rule number one for hiking or whatever. So we usually find ourselves, unfortunately, on the side of the law where we are um, being pursued. And, and we try to use that as a way of furthering our kind of witnessing element. For example, in that case, the, the, parks, or the Department of Parks and Recreation or whatever, for the program, the, in the Denmark, they were like, well, there's this place that can get water and this place. So we actually went to those places and took water, our photos, and the, the water was green and these like nasty cattle tanks or like a little puddle. So it was an opportunity to really challenge the uh, establishment. And um, that was another one that, that we ended up winning. And also, I've, I've got to mention my presentation real quick. We're looking for uh, high clearance four wheel drive vehicles. This has everything to do with the question, but I threw it out there. Like, uh, <laughs> Just weave, the, weave your plug into the answer. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. I, I think it's my early uh, Catholic grade school uh, education that causes me to stand up when I speak. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, I wanted to uh, piggyback on something Elizabeth said. Um, I'm, I'm related to uh, my efforts to abolish the death penalty. I do work at the Justice Center, which is a day resource center for uh, homeless elderly, people over 55. And Cass Overflow puts people on the street about 5.30 in the morning. Our Justice Center doesn't open up until 7 o'clock. Consequently, we, we get a lot of people lining up uh, and on the sidewalk. Now, if they're seated on the sidewalk, there's one cop with the Capitol Police who's got a bug up, and he comes and he writes them trespassing tickets. So, so they get criminal trespass for waiting for our building to open up. We don't want them charged, but they get them. So then I have to go down to court with them, and the, the prosecutors down there do the prosecutorial discretion and throw them all out. But it's just a waste of time, and it's a harassment of these people very much what you say. People get into a situation they can't get out of. I wanted to jump on something Janetta said about procedure and policy. In December, I had occasion to sit in on a Superior Court when uh, the Federal Public Defender's Office, who handles habeas unit, habeas crimes, there's the people that defend people in that last moment before execution. And they're suing the Department of Corrections for violation of the department's protocol for killing people. Now the absurdity of it is we're not talking about the right of society to take a life. We're discussing the way life ought to be taken. And in 2009, Chuck Ryan, the director of the DOC, uh, agreed to certain protocols. He's violated all these protocols. I mean, there's supposed to be a medical man who can observe what's going on. Well, they use a screen. The medical person isn't there. Somebody from the Justice Department is there. And if he perceives something's wrong, he can signal the medical person. Um, well, it's in violation of protocol. They're supposed to use an injection into, into the arm. Now, they choose to do uh, an injection in, into uh, the groin, which is really a surgical procedure. But it's in violation of protocol. Brian's response is, well, as director of the department, he thinks he has the discretion to do what he wants to do. And, and the judge agrees with him. Anyhow, I just thought it was absurd you're talking about the procedural policies up in the Ninth Circuit Court, and, and we have the same silly, silly problems down here in Superior Court. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Do you want to just make it? <clears throat> yeah, very brief. I'm sure you keep it brief. Okay. First of all, sacred sites, um, not only the San Francisco Peaks, but the Tohono O'odham Nation, which is right along the border of Mexico and the United States, of course, who was there before there was ever a border. So the United States and all these other occupying territories are trespassing on their sacred sites and imposing their policies. And I know that a lot of these issues kind of connect with the, the Kulaks, the mountain, the South Mountain, the, two, the 202, um, obviously Mount Brown, and seeing how the justice system rules and works against you know, indigenous issues. Not once does the Supreme Court ever rule in favor of indigenous people. But currently in the UN, there is a, a case, the CERD, I think is how it's referred to, and they're hearing um, testimony on racism as we speak, I believe. And it's something that is kind of unprecedented since uh, the Obama administration had actually signed on to the Declar Declaration of Indigenous Peoples' Rights. So that's something that is interesting. We're going to see how that shapes up because whether the United States really respects what the United Nations has to say, obviously they signed on to it. So it is a legally binding agreement. So that is something that is attached with the, the San Francisco Coalition, or, or not with the San Francisco Coalition, but with the San Francisco Peaks. And they're here in testimony on all of that. And the Hopi tribe does have a lawsuit right now against the city of Flagstaff for an illegal contract. And it was basically thrown out of the district court, they're appealing that. And that's and for us, we're still at the point where we're with the, within some sort of appeal process. There's not much further for us to take our case, unfortunately. And the, the law, as it is written, becomes precedent. And there's not a lot of opportunity to change that.
I'd just like to say really quickly that as indigenous people, the United States created the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs was uh, made to control and assimilate and annihilate our people. And today, as indigenous people who want to protect our ancestral homelands, we have to go to the government justice system in order to ask for protection. So the same people who've been trying to kill us off since they arrived are the people we're asking to protect our culture, to protect our homeland. Perhaps that's pessimistic, pessimistic, but maybe there's some optimism in there as well.